So, pain management, uh, you know, acute pain management is a fundamental part of all of our jobs. So I feel slightly foolish standing here in front of a room of an anaesthetist telling you how to manage acute pain. But um, I must well do it. So this talk is going to be about very much NUH kind of practical management of acute pain in paediatric patients. So it's, it's going to be talking about... Sorry, I've not done anything. Uh, it's going to be talking about... The, um, how we assess um, uh, the assessment tools that we use for pain management in, in children, the prescriptions that we have, the guidance that is available to you, and then linking that to the cases that you'll commonly be involved in. Talk about, about troubleshooting, um, and that's about it. So, um, people worry about assessing pain in children and think that it's difficult or it's challenging or that it can't be done. And there's a lot of evidence to show that it can be done, and it can be done reliably. There are lots of validated tools that have been adapted for use in children, from neonates, which is NIPS, and CRIES, right up to you know, um, adulthood, and including the, the um, children with cognitive um, disabilities as well. Ideally, we'd want to use a self-reporting tool, but obviously that can't be done in all children, so we can move on to behavioural tools. Um, and... <coughs> If we have to, we use physiological tools, but usually, even in the neonates, those are incorporated into a behavioural tool with a little bit of physiological parameters included in that. And I'm not going to talk about neonates any further because you're not going to do them. So, with our self-reporting um, tools, the one that you should all know about is the smiley faces. So this came out, Wong and Baker, in, first came out in 1988-ish. It has been revised because the original smiley faces was felt on further assessment to be looking more at happiness and whether the child felt happy rather than, than um, pain. So actually, this is what we prefer to use, which is actually kind of grimacing, going from not grimacing to severe grimacing, because grimacing is a kind of universal expression of pain rather than a smiley face. But if you look on the internet, there are lots of different smiley faces, um, from you know four faces up to six faces, uh, you know, emojis, superheroes, anything you want, you could see and find it on the internet. We also use numerical rating scales and visual analog scales. And and um, you know, our visual analog scales we can incorporate smiley faces onto that at both extremes and use those in children as well. And in our young children who are verbal, obviously, we can use categorical pieces of hurt. So you have um, uh, kind of poker chips or, you know, um, connect four chips, and you say, these are four pieces of pain. How many pieces of pain have you got now? Um, but how do we decide which tool to use for which child? And we use, the best predictor of that is to come back to the age of the child. Um, so in our very young children who are verbal, as I say, you can use the pieces of hurt. Um, but you can also start using smiley faces with them in the kind of under sevens. And over sevens, you're going to start, and or eights, you're going to start thinking about the um, visual analog scores or the numerical rating scores. So these are the assessment tools that we use. Um, this is our smiley face. Well, this, this is actually not, this has to be revised, so we're not using this one as much. But that was a, an old one that we had with the smiley faces. They're now going to the grimaces. Um, and this is our... Um, Verbal rating score. <laughs> so in certain groups of children, we can't use that self-reporting tools. And so we have to move on to the behavioural tools um, that are available to us. And so these are the pre-verbal children who can't tell us how they're feeling, um, as in vocally. Uh, they can scream and cry at us, obviously, but not tell us in words. Um, or children who are unable to communicate either because of neurodisability, severe autism, or anything like that. Um, and we can also use them to support self-reporting in the very young verbal child as well. Um, and what we do is we, we um, teach our, our nursing staff, we tell the parents about it as well, and we as the pain team use them. So we're looking at a combination of things. We're looking at the facial expression, we're looking at their posture and their movements, we're looking at um, you know, their crying, their vocalisation, um, and whether they can be consoled. 
And the most common one that we use is FLAP, Facial Legs Activity Prime Consolability. And this can be used in pre-verbal children and um, young people with cognitive impairment up to the age of 19. It's been validated. And so for those five parameters, we um, give them a score of 0 to 2, so a maximum score of 10. Um, and with, with behavioural schools, you're supposed to look at the child for up to five minutes, do a full assessment of them, and then rate them on, on this system. So, moving on. Uh, this is a whistle-stop tool. Okay. Um, what guidance is available to you? Hopefully, quite a bit. We should have laminated posters, and I'll show you some of those in the next few slides. With theatres being moved around a little bit, they sometimes <coughs> get lost, and as we've had some recent movement in our key theatres, I will have to go around and see if they're all still there. But they should either be in peace theatres or in peace recoveries or also up in ENT as well. But if they're not around and available, then on the internet you have two ways of getting to our information. If you go through anaesthesia, you can go on to paediatric anaesthesia and that's got all of our information where it's pain, pre-medication, local anaesthetic toxicity, tons of stuff. <laughs> I'm sorry. And if you go in through paediatrics, you can then go to um, directly to anaesthesia. So if you go into paediatrics on the guidelines on the internet, you can go into anaesthesia and get straight, straight to this link. Or you can go into pain management and you can get to um, our, our pain protocols from there as well. So, paracetamol is the bane of my life. <laughs> um, it is the drug that we have the most prescription or drug errors with. Those may be prescribing errors, drawing up errors, and administration errors, they may be dosing errors, they may be uh, giving a dose within a four hour period. My take home is look to see what the information is. The BNF is very happy to change it every time we bring it out, a new BNF. Um, this is the newest one that I have got to actually put up in the theatres. And into this we've incorporated the neonatal monograph, which I know you probably won't be involved in, and my advice to paediatric anaesthetists is don't give IV paracetamol to a neonate. Um, but it's there anyway. Um, Really, for the children that you're going to be involved in, they're over 10 kilos, they're over one years of age, and so the IV dose is the same as the oral dose. But I would say, look on the front of the chart, look in the regular section of the chart, look on the PRN section of the chart. If they come up from A&E, has it been given an A&E? And don't give a double dose. Um, my other concern with paracetamol is <coughs> dosing and obesity. So we have increasing numbers of overweight children. We can get a six or seven year old who's 60 kilos. And on this, you should give them a gram. But actually, they should be about 25 kilos and they should be on 375 milligrams QDS. And there's quite a difference in that. So think about the weight of the child and is that a weight that you would expect that child to be? And think about the actual weight that they should be and dose on that. Oh, did you do that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, so the MHRA brought out an alert in June 2013 saying that codeine should be used in children who are 12 years and under and should also try not to use it or shouldn't be used actually in, in young people under 18 who've got <coughs> documented obstructive sleep apnea. Obviously we've already said, or well, Matty's gone, it can be quite hard to document obstructive sleep apnea in a child because you can't get a sleep study. So we decided to um, remove codeine from our formulary and we developed a low-dose oromorphine um, kind of you know, formula, if you like, which is lower than the BNF-C dosing from um, moderate to severe pain. And this is what we use in most of our day cases, and it's the basis for tonsils. Obviously, we have issues around our tonsils, and you know, we're titrating to effect, or thinking about not using opiates in <coughs> patients with severe obstructive sleep apnea. Um, but it is available for people to use. Because codeine was removed from the formulary, um, we obviously are a renal centre, so we do get lots of children with renal impairment, um, which may be significant, or they may be on end-stage renal you know, dialysis treatment. And so with the um, renal team, we, they did a, um, a table which we're looking at combining age and the estimated GFR, which should be on the notes. And if a renal child is coming to theatre, the renal team are supposed to write their EGFR on their drug chart. 
doesn't always happen, but you can then use this to calculate the dose of morphine, which is reduced depending on that EGFR, but also the um, dosing interval may be prolonged as well. That's if they're going down the oral route. Um, so if you've got a renal child who's going, who can't be um, managed with the oral medication, you're going to go down IV, then you go to a fentanyl um, PCA or NCA. Okay. Prescriptions. Some people don't like all of our prescriptions. We do have a lot of them. And I'm not going to apologise for that because one prescription doesn't fit all patients. So um, it's much easier now that right across the trust we're all using the same pumps. So we've always been using these pumps, but you got on board and now you use them. But we do have specific paediatric pumps and adult pumps just because we've all got too many protocols between us and we can't all draw on one pump. So we have NCAs and PCAs. We have morphine and fentanyl. Um, the question about can a child have an NCA or a PCA? Between six and eight, you're starting to think about what to method is, is the better one for them. And that varies with the situation that the child's in. If you've got an elective six-year-old who's gone through pre-op, who's had, you know, who we've done a plan with, or we can talk to them about their, their analgesia management, um, then you can have them, you know, a six-year-old can quite easily sometimes use a PCA. If you've got an eight-year-old who's toxic, fed up, miserable, has got a nasty appendix, then they may not be in the right place to be using an NCA, uh, a PCA. And so even though in the elective situation they might have been, in that situation as acute surgery, they may not be in the place to use a, a PCA and may need an NCA. So, but between six and eight and the situation that child's in, start thinking about which method is the best way for them to have analgesia. Um, we, also use, we also use a lot of ketamine infusions, which is quite different from on the adult side. And I can put them on virtually any ward I want to now. Um, and we um, have the catalyst pumps for our epidurals, which I'm not going to talk about. Um, but we do like wound catheters for our laparotomies, and we do like nerve sheath catheters as well for trauma patients. So these are quick screenshots. Don't use it. They are in the same format as the adult prescription. Um, and they should really tell you how to make it up, and they'll have dosing about, you know, the lots and dosing as well. Mm. Pediatric PCAs, MCAs have to be made up by the anaesthetist. Recovery won't do it. I've talked to them multiple times, they won't do it. Pediatric nurses on the wards will do it, but the recovery nurses won't. So you do have to make it up yourself um, uh, and label it obviously appropriately. Um, we have stickers which correspond to all of these and the lots of stickers and antimetics, so it should be quite easy. Um, and we do ask whether it's an open or a laparoscopic appendix, whether it's perforated or completely normal and not inflamed, that all of our children get a PCA or an NCA, depending on their age post-op. That's because the third ons will know that they get the pain calls, and they also know that they're very busy elsewhere, and they don't often, well, they may struggle to get and deal with that inadequate pain management if they're busy elsewhere. So recovery are told, and the ward are told, that they should not take it a child out of recovery and back to the ward without a PCA or an NCA. So just do it. Or you will get called back to recovery to do it. Um, it doesn't stop them going home because no one goes home on the day of their surgery. It comes down the next day, they've had a good night's sleep, they're on to orals and they go home if it's not required. So please just do it. That's my one of the most, yeah, I sound very naggy. <laughs> uh, that's my lots of embarrassing. Okay, if you're doing a laparotomy or, um, again, for adult people, um, you may get to do the renal transplants. So we would suggest adding in a local anaesthetic wound infusion catheter. Our surgeons are really on board with them, we like them. Um, and we have shown that they do reduce our opiate requirements. And as I say, in the renal transplant teenagers that you may be involved in, we'd say use fentanyl as your first line opiate and the wound catheter as well. The other thing that a lot of you may do um, is scoliosis, whether that's electively or maybe for a washout or further surgery when they turn up on the um, emergency list. Um, and we these were a problem group for us, but we've got a good guideline for them and, and um, kind of management plan for them. Their opiate of choice is, is fentanyl, NCA or PCA, depending on the age of the child. They all get a ketamine infusion. They get regular simple analgesics and the nurses can just start monsteroidals on the day one post-op, as long as they're wound drains are minimal without having to ask the surgeon, so we ask the anaesthetist to write that up in theatre. They get regular antiemetics because we had 
about 50% of prisoners owners and bulletin rate with morphine when they were treated with morphine. Uh, they get regular laxatives because we know that's a problem. And we have a five day short course of um, gabapentin, which you can use um, for 10 milligrams per kilo TDS. And it's all on the internet if people are interested. This is what the ward use. I know it's a very busy slide, but the ward have a very um, structured plan on either troubleshooting <coughs> or reduction of analgesia over the, the first few days post op. Okay. Um, ketamine, we brought it in initially because of the scolies and initially it has to be on the uh, PhD UPICU but we showed it was safe, we showed it improved pain management we went back to MNC and got it rolled out to the wards with a teaching package so now if a ward can take a PCA patient they can take a ketamine infusion patient and we've also moved out to our acute inflammatory bowel disease patients who the gastro team don't like having opiates because of the association with opiates and toxic megacolon um, and also we use it a lot on our chemotherapy um, patients who get mucositis so it's it's and but you can use it in any complex patient and it can be part of your troubleshooting as well if you call to see a patient with complex pain management that they're struggling on the ward you can add in ketamine um, if you're doing um, orthopedic mm -hmm. cases whether that's an elective list or um, a trauma list then we're quite happy for you to use nerve catheters or do nerve blocks and use nerve catheters and run infusions we do say though that if the child is under 50 kilos, then you use the Capsolis pump. And in that, you, when you're opening up into paediatrics, you've got epidurals and then you've got local anesthetic infusions. We use that protocol for both our wound catheters and our nerve sheath catheters. Um, and we divide it into under rates, which is not to two mils an hour, or over so nine and above, which is, can go up to five mils an hour. If you've got a young person who's over 50 kilos on a trauma list, we're quite happy for them to have the Accufuser run. Um, but please just document it on here that you're using an Accufuser because they'll just go back to D34 and D34 will now, now quite happily take Accufusers for the over 50 kilos children. So as I said, troubleshooting. Um, hopefully we're pre proactive, certainly with our elective patients. We kind of encourage people to do a plan A and a plan B. So if you're considering managing someone with orals, but you're not sure if you can if manage that, we say do a prescription for an NCA, and then the nurses on the ward can just set that up if they feel that pain is not adequately controlled. Um, so hopefully for our elective patients, there is a plan B already prescribed um, and that the nurses can just implement. But obviously, and, and again, I hope that our elected patients aren't really troublesome. The ones that you may get called for are more likely to be the um, inflammatory bowel disease young people, um, the uh, oncology patients can be quite challenging. We have a small population but um, of sickle cell patients with sickle cell disease and they can have you know, significant crises and, and pain management and those patients can be a challenge. But whether it's a acute post-op pain patient or one of those medically sort of acute pain patients, it's the same thing really. Assess the pain, get information from the nursing staff, from the parents, from the child, review the drug chart. Can you optimise any doses? Is everything on the PRN section the nurses aren't giving it, which still happens? Um, move it to regular, optimised doses. If they're on um, regular oral analgesic, then escalate to an NCA or PCA. If they're on an NCA or a PCA, can you optimise the background? Because all of our patients will have a background on their PCA or NCA. Can you reduce the lockout on their PCA or NCA? Um, and if you've done all of that and they're still in significant pain, then I'd say add in ketamine. Um, which is very well tolerated with our prescriptions. So, any questions?